And today we're continuing in our series on the book of James. And one of the things that we cover in this book of James, and the reason why we called our series through the book of James, Be Real, is because all of us value authenticity, right? It's still one of the things we prize. It's one of the, still, one of the things we still look for in society, in people, in our politics. We hope for it, right? Um, but when we're talking about authentic, you know what I'm talking about. It's about being real, someone who's not fake. They're not a show. In fact, there's no significant breakdown between what they say and what they do, how they appear, appear rather, and who they truly are. Now, if there are some inconsistencies in their life, they can still be authentic if they openly own them, right? In other words, someone can be called authentic, authentic by confessing failures and struggles. The key is that they're being real and truthful in terms of who they really are. Now, when someone isn't authentic, they get canceled, right? Sometimes literally. For example, many of you know about Ellen DeGeneres. Now, just for those of you who don't know who she is, uh, she'd had an incredible career. Starring in a sitcom, Ellen, during the 90s and then beginning in 2003, uh, she had her own syndicated talk show. In fact, she's hosted Oscars, Emmys, Grammys, and she's won a quite a few awards herself, as in 30 Emmys and 20 People's Choice Awards. And in fact, in 2016, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I mean, she has been well touted and lauded. Of course, most importantly of all, if you're a parent or a grandparent, she was Dory in Finding Nemo, right? So much of her image, much of her popularity, much of her appeal was built around this motto that she carried. In fact, her ta talk show tagline was, be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. And perhaps you know, her show was canceled last year. Now, if you follow the story, it came out that her show was being investigated. Investigated for what? Well, you see, DeGeneres was accused of running a very hostile workplace. She was accused of harassing her staff are accused of having an aggressive nature and aggressive conduct toward those, everyone she worked with. And soon after it all came out, the generous announced that her show would end after 19 seasons. That could have gone on. But what happened? Well, it's quite simple. You see, the person she pushed to be, in fact, the tagline, remember, be kind to one another? Turned out she herself wasn't very kind at all. In other words, we found out that she wasn't real. And see, we know how important it is for us to be real in life. And I don't believe there's a single one of us who want to be inauthentic. There's not a single one of us who doesn't want to be the genuine article. Right? I think... It's like embedded in us. And that's part of why we long to be who we are in terms of, hey, hey, just, I'm going to be true to ourselves. But hey, sometimes authenticity can kind of get messed up because if we're authentically a bad person, we need to change. <laughs> but there's an authenticity that God prescribes for us that can make an incredible difference in our lives. And so we're in the series, like I said, in the book of James. Be real. Be authentic. And today we're going to look into how our lives can be significant in this authenticity. So if you have your Bible, open your Bible to James chapter 1. And we're going to look at two verses today. Verse 26 and 27. James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. In fact, let's all stand as we honor the reading of God's awesome word. James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. I'll read it out loud. Just follow along with me. 
It reads, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That's what we're going to cover today. And it, you're going to find that it hits us right between the eyes. Let's pray once again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We ask that you guide us and teach us, but don't just teach us, but change us. We ask this because we want to be real with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now, if you notice in our passage reading, it again goes to authenticity. It goes to being real because it talks about pure and faultless religion. Now, before we just glide past that, we do need to spend a little time because that word religion is kind of a loaded word. It really is a loaded word in our day because it's a word that we throw around in our culture right now. And it's a, it's a word that a lot of people are familiar with, but not necessarily understand the essence of what it means. In fact, the term religion, in terms of appearance in Scripture, is actually a rare term in the New Testament. And in fact, it's not necessarily the best translation of the original Greek word that we find here. And, and it's actually apropos that the term religion is rare in the New Testament, in fact, in Scripture itself, because being a Christ follower, living as a Christ follower, is not a religion. In fact, at First LG, we actually blatantly say we hate religion. Why? Here's why. Because religion at its core is essentially how we can reach God. That's the essence of religion. See, it's about how whether we can be good enough to reach God, give enough to reach God, sacrifice enough to reach God, be legalistic enough to reach God. It's about our effort to get to him. But the good news of Jesus Christ is this, is that God reached us. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Because why? No one, not even the most moral person on the planet, can save themselves. And the reason is quite obvious. No one's perfect. No one matches up to the standard that God has set because the standard is God himself, right? But God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into the world who lived a perfect life. He alone and died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, and whoever turns to him, their sins can be forgiven, they can have new life, and they can receive eternal life beyond this life and significant purpose in this life. That's the good news of Jesus. Therefore, Christianity is not a religion. It's not a doctrine. It's not a creed or a moral code or even a worship service. It's a new life based on a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we square? I hope that we, we can't state that enough. Because in our day, it's very easy to slip into a religious mode and by find ourselves in a place where God would not have us to be. Now, with this new life includes a new identity. And in fact, our study of the book of James is how our identity actually fleshes out in real life. And so what we can read and what we do read in verse 26 and 27, and we can understand a little bit more uh, expanded when we understand that the word religion can also be translated in terms of it's, it, the way it's supposed to express in our lives as worship. In other words, it's better to understand this context of Scripture in terms of how we are expressing our relationship. And, we can just, and, and the Bible describes that as worship. In fact, let me give you a definition 
of what authentic worship is. In fact, authentic worship is an outward expression of inward devotion that reveals God's grace through our lives. Let me read it again. Authentic worship is the outward expression of inward devotion that reveals God's grace through our lives. See, worship is not my attempt to earn God's favor or earn God's grace. Worship is a response to God's grace. That's what true worship always is. So understanding that, let me read the passage again. So I want to just to expand that verse and let's read it this way. James chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. Those who consider themselves an authentic worshiper and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their worship is worthless. Authentic worship that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. See, what God's word is teaching us is how do we live this life out? What does it truly look like? How can we be authentic in it? And here's the point, okay? The experience of the grace of God always results in the expression of grace of God. See, the experience of the grace of God always results in the expression of the grace of God through our lives toward others. That's how it works. And if that's not working in our lives, something is amiss. Something is off alignment. Something is not right. And if you're here today or if you're watching online and you don't have a personal relationship with God... There's no motion, no ceremony, no ritual you can go through to perform that's going to earn you a right standing with God. Because the grace of God is experienced when we realize there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. The only thing we can do is throw ourselves on the mercy and the grace of God who provided a way in Jesus Christ through Jesus' death and burial and resurrection to forgive us our sins and bring us by grace into a right relationship with God. But once we've done that, once we've by faith surrenders ourselves to Jesus and Jesus has made us right with God, the experience of God's grace in our lives always results in the expression of God's grace through our lives to others. That's how it works. That's how it works. Here's what I hope all of us can see. Our lives are meant to be what is called a conduit. How many of you know what a conduit is? In fact, there's a picture of us of a conduit on screen that we're going to play for you, display for you just now. Now, a conduit is, and if you, if you know, if you've been in field, you know, construction, you've used conduits, right? In fact, there are conduits running all over this building. Conduit is a pipe or a tube through which something passes. It's that simple. It's that simple. And in fact, your garden hose is a conduit for water. And what I'm unpacking for us today what I hope that we really nail down is that we are designed to be a conduit of God's grace. We're meant to receive God's grace personally and express God's grace personally to others. That's what we're designed for. Now, I'm not talking about perfection. No, because we're not going to be perfect this side of heaven. Here's what I am talking about, however. I am, I'm not talking about perfect. I'm talking about pattern. Pattern. 
A pattern, the pattern of our lives is now that we, whether or not we're at church or at school, or whether we're at the ball field, whether we're at Walmart, whether we're at the job, our lives have become a conduit where the grace of God is expressed and fleshed out because we ourselves have experienced it. See, being a follower of Jesus is a declaration that we haven't arrived. In other words, we're not the person that we're supposed to be. But the point is, by the grace of God, we're not the person we used to be. We're changed. We're different. In fact, we are being changed and transformed by a life of worshiping God. And here's what the Bible's saying. If your worship isn't spilling out in a Christ-like life toward others, then what we describe as worship, according to Scripture, it's worthless. I want you to let, this, let, you sink, let, let that sink in for a second. If God's grace is not being allowed to flow through you to the point of impacting the lives of other people and the way we relate to other people, that our lives, excuse me, our worship is worthless. In fact, James chapter 1, verse 26, the latter part of that verse is this. And their religion is what? Worthless. Now, that Greek word that is translated worthless, I just kind of dwelt on that word because it's such a hard-hitting word. And it means devoid of meaning, devoid of significance. See, we can go through all the motions of church, but if we're not, if it's not coming out of us in a form of a changed life, where the grace of God is flowing through my life and to others, then, then what I've got isn't the real thing. It's not the real thing. And I was just thinking, worth, the, the term worthless, I, there's so many people today struggle with where their life is right now. In fact, we live in a world where we feel kind of caught hopeless and helpless, Right? And we want our lives to be more, count more, be, be more of an impact. And, and, and come on, none of us want to live an insignificant life. But here's the thing. We do not connect the dots as God spells it out. That the basis and the foundation of our life in terms of being a significant life is grounded upon worship. And the expression of worship in our lives. In fact, the, the term worship comes from the old English worth-ship. That's what worship, how we got the word worship. In other words, it's declaring the worth of our great and glorious King, Jesus Christ. And when we understand what's worth it, that's Jesus then our worship creates a life that is worthy. See, so many times we have this disconnect. Our life, the reason why Scripture all over calls us to worship Him is not because God's up in heaven going, I'm not getting enough attention. No. No. God does not have insecurity issues. He doesn't need us. He wants our affections because he loves us. But he calls us to worship him because in so doing, it is the natural response or the natural result of a life that has experienced his grace. And as a result, it just flows out. It just flows over. Because when you experience Jesus, 
like Paul mentioned a little bit earlier about his life. But there are many of us here in this room who can describe how it has impacted, he has impacted our lives. Because there was a time when your life was so broken, you're so lost, and the Lord stepped into your life and gave you direction, gave you healing, gave you meaning, gave you hope. And you know without him, you could not have made it this far. And that's why in his Psalms, we see David saying, you know, your praise will always be on my lips. Why? Because it's in full recognition of the goodness of God in our lives, what he's done for us. And of course, we can't help but to respond in that way. And when we respond that way, it's the foundation and basis of a significant life because of what we unpack in this passage next. See, if you want the real thing, if you want the real thing, yes, you know, uh, you know singing church, attending a you know, life group, all those things can be an expression of worship. But our passage in the book of James points out what authentic worship looks like. While this is not an exhaustive list, whew, boy, does it hit us where we live. And here's the first thing that our passage tells us. Authentic worship is revealed in the things I say. Authentic worship is revealed in the things I say. James chapter 1, verse 26. Again, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. We can come to church. We can be the loudest singer. Some of you can really sing, right? I'm glad you can. I mean, you can have your hands raised the highest. I mean, in fact, you can go to 20 Bible studies, all right? And you can serve on every ministry team. But here's what God's word says. If it doesn't change the way you speak to other people, it's not the real thing. Ouch. Can other people see in the way you communicate that God is changing your life and the things that you say is a conduit of his grace with your words? See, as we go through this study of James together, we're going to find out that the book of James has a lot to say about the tongue. And why does God's word mention the tongue so much? Well, it's quite obvious, isn't it? Because that's a big part of our lives, right? In fact, there's been a recent study that's been done that reveals that on average, we speak about 16,000 words a day. Some of you are like, man, that's so low. But some of you may be sitting next to a guy that is, <laughs> that you wish they could speak 16,000 words a day. But think about it, 16,000 words a day. It's enough to fill an average book in three days. That's how many words we speak. In other words, if you took all the words that we spoke in total of three days, we could have a book. And in fact, if you took all the words that you spoke over the course of a year, you could write 120 books. A lot of words. In fact, if you did the math, we spend about 20 or more percent of our lives communicating with other people. And the primary way, therefore, of expressing authentic worship to God there is going to be the way we talk to other people, the way we communicate with others. And so the way you communicate with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your classmates, all those things will have a big impact in our lives and in their lives, right? Right? So how do we change our communication? Because if, as I was talking about this, 
And some of you are thinking, boy, that's hard. It's just hard. Because if you're like me, there's at least one time a day where you go, man, I just stuck my foot in my mouth. Have you ever done that? Have you done that this morning already? Have you done that on the way to church? Isn't that, I mean, it seems hard, right? Some, you're saying, like, talent. It, this, for some of us, like, it's so difficult. But there is a way. And God's word tells us how. Let's look at passage again. Look at passage again. James chapter 1, verse 26. See, those who consider themselves religious, and here it is, and yet do not keep a tight rein. The key's there. To keep a tight rein on their tongues. Deceive themselves. I don't know if you've ever been horseback riding. I'm, I don't do any horseback riding right now, but I've done enough to know what, that's, what is involved in there. And boy, horses are big, powerful creatures. I'm just curious. How many of you have ever been horseback riding? I'm just, wow, a good number of you. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, a horse is tremendous. It's huge, right? And yet, you control this huge, powerful animal with basically a small little thing. And it seems like the tongue is way too powerful for us to control. But scripture says that we can have control of our tongues if we will lean into this small yet powerful truth. Okay? Our tongues need to be bridled like a horse needs to be bridled. Now, let me give you a picture of what a bit and bridle looks like because a bridle really is two pieces, right? That's a little metal piece that goes in a horse's mouth and you see the leather thing that's attached to the ring? That, those are the reins that goes in the rider's hands. And now, those of you who've ever been horseback riding and those of you who want to, you do not want to give a loose rein to your horse meaning that leather strap that's connected to the bit of the horse's mouth, if it's loose, basically you're saying to the horse, go wherever you want it to go. And you know what the horse typically does? Goes wherever it wants to go, usually back to the barn. That's what the scripture is pointing out. We live a life with a loose rein. And what God says instead, no, 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 you got to tighten that up. But the tightening of the reins isn't done by us. You see, if we are to biblically keep a tight rein on our tongues, it means that we need to put the bit in our mouths and hand over the reins to the Holy Spirit of God. So that our mouths, the way we communicate, is under the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. And if you mindfully do that, intentionally do that with your life, you actually sense the direction and leadership of God in the way you speak. He will. If you relinquish control to the Holy Spirit of God with your tongue... God will actually go, Talon, you need to shut up right now. That's happened to me. Like, I'm in a situation, I'm like, I got so much to say. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> right? The Holy Spirit literally goes, no, 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 no. Don't you go there. And every time I listened, it was better. <laughs> every time. And sometimes, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but you're in a conversation and all of a sudden, you start saying things and you start going in a direction where you never thought of before the conversation, but it comes out of you and it just goes and goes and goes. And I'm like, I didn't even think that, but, it, but that's when the Holy Spirit does. When you give your tongue, the Holy, sometimes the Holy Spirit goes, no, no, let's change the conversation this way. And when we do, when we follow, when he does that in our lives, we say things we never thought we might say, 
but it was just the right thing for the other person to hear. Because I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I walk around off of some counseling sessions, and I walk out of there, and I'm going like, that wasn't me. How many have ever been there? This isn't just some woo spiritual experience. This is supposed to be normative for the Christian life. Because the Christian life is a supernatural life led by the very Holy Spirit of God. And the reason why we need to engage in this, why authentic worship always will include the way we speak, is because our lives are made significant or we become devoid of significance by our speech. And you know that's true. You know it. How many of you are in the trouble you're in because of what you said? How many of us are in the position of influence because of what we're able to say? Right? So, when we give the reins to the Holy Spirit of God and put the bit in our mouths, the bit of surrender... What does it look like for the things that I say to be under the control of the Holy Spirit? Well, it looks like this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. That's what it looks like. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Let me pause there. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. What is included in unwholesome talk? Okay. Foul language. You want to know how to cancel your witness for Jesus and your presence of Jesus in your life and the impact of Jesus for your life? Have cuss words come out of your mouth. It will. It'll cancel you right there. Because they go like, wait, aren't they, aren't they so-and-so a Christian? And you're sitting this saying this blankety blank, blank, blank stuff. And you're going, there's a disconnect here. You know what I'm talking about? Well, how about this? Unwholesome talk can be understood as coarse joking, nasty jokes. Oh, it's just humor. No. What are you saying? What are you saying? And yet what's so tragic is you hear so many people who, who, you know, who profess the name of Jesus. And not only do they say stuff like that, but they consistently ingest this. They watch, you know, videos of this, read stuff about this all the time. Gossip. That's not wholesome. When we start talking bad about other people behind their backs, oh, wow, that is so destructive. And I know that people literally, like some people literally live on it, right? But that's not going to build anybody up. It won't. And also... When we take the name of the Lord Jesus or the name of God in vain, that's unwholesome. Scripture tells us that the name of Jesus is the only name by which we can be saved. Remember, we sang about it. It is a powerful name. It is a beautiful name. It is a precious name. And we need to revere the name. His name is not a cuss word. He's not an expletive that we can just use just for. And when we do it, when we do that, it creates, see, we, we're not ascribing proper worth with our lives, with our words. Some of you are thinking, but Talon, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs so that it may benefit those who listen? Some of you are thinking, my talent, that's not possible. And you know what? When the rain is in our hands, when the rains are in our hands, it's not. In our strength, we can't. It's not possible. But when we do put the bit in our mouth and hand over to control the reins to the Holy Spirit of God, it is possible. It absolutely is possible. And your life can be a conduit of God. Now, we get it right all the time. No. No. See, your life can still be a conduit of grace of God. Let me explain how. See, even when we get it wrong, you know what a heart of worship does? It leads us to repentance. It does. And go to that person to make it right. And we go to those people that we have communicated with, with wrongly and we make it right. We humble ourselves. And you know what that happens? You know what happens when we do that? They experience the grace of God. See, we've got to be aware of this. We've got to be aware of this. Because what you say, how you say it, it impacts you. And it connects to the degree of significance you can have with your life. See, our worship of the Lord will reflect the worthiness of our lives. By the way, when we talk about communication, we talk about the tongue. It also includes our, the way we do texting and social media. Because too many of us, we just kind of just, because we live in a society like, hey, if you feel it, if you think it, just shoot it, right? Send it. Post it. Be careful. In fact, um, here's some guidelines that I want to share with you that will be good. In fact, I encourage you to take a picture of this. But here it is. Here are the four things that you may want to keep. Oh, let's leave it up there. Thank you so much. Yeah. See, check your heart before you start. Pray before you post. This is important too. Make sure someone you trust has read it before you spread it. And then finally, when in doubt, don't. And folks, don't let this be just something that you're just taking a picture of. Let it actually become a filter of your life. Because what it will do is it will hand over the reins to the Holy Spirit of God in your life. And here's what you kind of person you become doing this. You become a person that is able to live a significant life because you bless others. You bless others. And there's not a single one of you that isn't created to make a significant difference with your one and only life. You were created to be a difference maker. You weren't meant to live a life that just goes on. And no matter what situation you may find yourself now, you may not be in a situation that you like right now, but you can begin a life of significance right now simply by worshiping the Lord, by saying things that are worth saying, which is to share the grace of God in your life, to others. Let it build others up. In fact, that's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus did. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve, and he proved it by giving his life for many. And what we need to do today, because some of you are struggling, man, I, I, I feel like my life's not going anywhere. I feel like my life's not reaching any mean of signif- meaning or significance. What it may need, to need is, what you may need to do is to say, Lord, 
I want my life to be a conduit of your grace. And that may mean for some of you, it's about first receiving his grace. The problem may be there. God has gone to the cross. Jesus died for you, and he offers his love and forgiveness and grace freely. And it's yours to receive, but here's how you receive it. You have to open your heart and say, Lord, I turn from my way, and I need you, and I need this grace, and I'm before you. And when you do, you will receive God's grace and mercy. Now, perhaps the reason why we're having a struggle is because not because we receive it, because we're not letting it flow. We may be receiving it. We may recognize the grace of God in our lives. But we're not letting it flow out the way it should. And for some of us, we've got to repent of that. We say, Lord, I realize I've totally missed the boat on this. And I need to surrender this area of my life. Where are you? May you live a worthwhile life as you talk in a way that glorifies and worships our Lord Jesus Christ.